You're listening to the Dune Sh- Steve. Oh, man. You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now is he. A little. And now here's your hosts, Big Anklevich and Rish Outfield. Now, forget it! Hey ho, little fish! Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Volume 2, number 2, page 11. I am one of your hosts, Rish Outfield. And I'm Big Anklevich, the other host. The sort of co host, R O N O T. Don Pardo ain't got nothing on me. I am the man. Announcer man. This is much better. Welcome, everybody, on this beautiful, sunny, summer... Wait, it's fall. This is the fall issue. Yeah, we said absolutely nothing last week about it, did we? Yeah, that's weird. Maybe because that episode was done in May! Probably true. What is today's episode, Big? Today's episode is... Mermaid Beach by Douglas T. Araujo. Thank you. I wouldn't have been able to manage that. Douglas is a Brazilian writer who lives in Sao Paulo with his wife, two children, and a dog. Born on Halloween night of 1970, he has been an avid reader since his childhood, with a strong preference for speculative fiction. He began writing while he was still very young, mainly mystery and science fiction stories. But it was only when he began writing horror that he knew he had found his true vocation. His work has appeared since then in several magazines and anthologies such as The Asylum, Volume 3, The Blackest Death, Volume 1 and 2, and Sideshow, Tales of the Big Top and the Bizarre. We'd like to thank Liz Mirzieski for lending her voice to this episode. And today's music is by Roger Subarana and Jorge dos Santos. And check out our show notes for links to everything. Mermaid Beach by Douglas T. Araujo. The old fisherman sat on a small bench in front of his house, holding his pipe and looking worried, his eyes fixed on the place where the road mixed with the horizon. He was waiting. He wondered what would happen to the village if nobody showed up. His eyes moved from the road to the children playing on the sand, then over to the women and men who walked here and there, pretending not to be concerned. What would they do if no one appeared? It had never happened, though. He didn't know how or why, but somebody had always come. On the same day, somebody came. That's why he was there, waiting. It was his duty to warn them. He had always warned them, the way his father had done, and his grandfather before him. The newcomers never heeded their warnings, but it was his duty nonetheless. He didn't know why, but he knew it was the right thing to do. It was part of what needed to happen. Part of the ritual. Slowly, his eyes moved to his right. From here, he could clearly see Mermaid Beach in the distance. Mermaid Rock, contrasting with the white sand, the wooden cabin, the blue sea. The tide was high now. Huge waves crashed on the beach. He stared at the ocean for some minutes. The wind played with his thin white hair and threw sand at his tanned face. But he didn't notice. It was a beautiful place. The old fisherman turned to the road again. Nobody yet. What if this year was different? What if they didn't come? What would happen then? But of course they would come. They always did. As if to confirm this thought, a red car appeared on the horizon. It was coming fast, a cloud of dust following it. He stood, hoping there wasn't a child inside. 
He still remembered the little boy from two years ago. So innocent, so pure, so unaware of what was about to happen. The old fisherman sighed. (sighs) He really hoped there wasn't a child inside that car. He hated it when children died. Are you sure this is the right way? Claire asked, beginning to look concerned. I think so, John answered. This must be that little fishing village the travel agent told us about. We shouldn't be far from the cabin, John answered. Claire looked at the small houses ahead of them. There were no more than a dozen, split between the two sides of the dirt road. Claire thought they would make a beautiful picture with the blue ocean and the white sand behind them. As they approached, Claire could make out the details. The walls painted with lime, the small windows, the clothes hanging on the lines. On the left, a group of boys played soccer in the sand. On the right, a woman's curious face watched them from a doorway. Lucy would have loved this, Claire thought, and her heart welled up with sadness. I wish she could be here with us. But she wasn't. Nothing could bring their little girl back. It had been a year, and Claire knew she needed to accept it. With tears in her eyes, she looked at John's face, wondering if her husband was thinking the same thing. From his expression, she guessed he was. Let's ask somebody for directions, Claire said, trying to push Lucy from her mind and get John to think about something else. After all... That was the main reason why they had made the trip to this deserted beach. They needed to forget. They needed to rebuild their lives together without Lucy. All right, John agreed. I'll ask that old man up there. John stopped the car in front of the last house in the village, where a fisherman was sitting on a bench with a pipe in his hand. As soon as the car slowed, he stood and came to the window, as if he was expecting them. Good morning. John smiled. Could you tell us how to get to Mermaid Beach? The old fisherman's gaze wandered from John to Claire. He stared at her with dark, penetrating eyes, and she felt as if he could see deep inside her soul. You are not far, the old man said. Claire noticed that there were only a few yellowish teeth left in his mouth. Can you see that dark rock up there? He pointed with his pipe. Yes. John said, looking toward it. That's called the Mermaid Rock. It's right in the middle of Mermaid Beach. Go straight down this road and make a left at the first turn off. It's easy. Well, thank you, John said, and shifted into first gear. However, the old fisherman continued, his face now so close to Claire that she could smell the rank pipe tobacco on his breath. I must warn you. Mermaid Beach is a dangerous place. Stay out of the water. It's treacherous. Thank you, John repeated. We'll keep that in mind. Listen to me, the old man said more firmly. Don't go in the water. Do you hear me? It will try to lure you in. But under no circumstances are you to enter the water. The sea is dangerous there. Deadly. Please... John pressed the gas and the car lunged ahead, leaving the fisherman behind. Claire looked over her shoulder. He was still standing on the road, staring at them. Don't go in the water! He shouted once more as they drove toward Mermaid Beach. From the porch of the little wooden cabin where they were spending the weekend... John looked at the beach. A light breeze was blowing, cool and refreshing. The sea was so blue that it seemed to melt into the sky. His eyes wandered from the white sand to the big, dark rock that protruded from the sea. Mermaid Rock, the old man had called it. Waves crashed against it with a sound like thunder, spraying water into the air. John sighed. (sighs) It was beautiful. Very beautiful. Lucy would have loved it, he thought. 
and he felt a tightening in his chest. John? Claire peered through the doorway. Let's take a walk. What do you think? Sounds great to me, he said, and he wiped away a lone tear with the back of his hand. Claire looked at the blue sky above her, at the whiteness of the sand at her feet. She felt the breeze on her face, the moisture in the air, the warmth of John's hand on her own. She smiled. For the first time in a year, she felt happy. For the first time in an entire year, she really believed they could leave the past behind and build their lives again. She looked at John, wanting to tell him so, wanting to tell him how much she loved him. But what she saw in his face made her smile disappear. The same sad expression she had seen so many times in the last year was back. He was looking at the ocean, lost in his thoughts, his eyes wet with tears. Claire knew he was thinking about Lucy again and blaming himself for the accident. She sighed. She couldn't bear seeing her husband torture himself. Enough time had gone by now. He needed to forget the past. They needed to forget the past. Lucy wasn't coming back, and they couldn't live on memories forever. Let's swim, she said suddenly, dragging him by his arm to the water, trying to distract him. What? Claire, no. Let's go. She tried to pull his arm again. It'll be fun. I don't want to swim, he said matter-of-factly. You know I don't like to. You can go. I'll sit here and watch. She hesitated. She knew if she left him alone, he'd only start thinking about Lucy again. Are you sure? She asked. He nodded. Go. I'll sit over there and wait. He moved toward the place he had pointed to on the beach. Claire watched him go, still unsure. He sat down and waved at her. She waved back. The sad expression had disappeared from his face. He wasn't staring into the past anymore. Claire thought he looked fine. At least for now, he wasn't dwelling on Lucy. She smiled, satisfied. Then she turned and walked toward the sea. Sitting on the sand, John watched Claire splash into the water and couldn't keep his mind from drifting to Lucy again. He was amazed at how much Claire reminded him of his daughter. They had the same way of walking, talking, smiling. Each time John saw Claire laugh, he saw Lucy. His sweet Lucy. He remembered her laughing at the club's playground while he pushed her on the swing. She was so happy that day. Hiya, Daddy! She said to him. Push me! John pushed and the swing arched toward the sky. Lucy whooped with delight. He laughed with her, (laughs) then peeked over his shoulder at the television set on the bar. Not yet, but the game will be starting any minute. John backed away from the swing. I'm going to watch the game, okay, sweetie? No! Lucy put her feet on the ground and halted the swing. Stay here with me, Daddy. John looked at the bar again. Several men were already sitting in front of the screen. It was the most pivotal game of the season. You can stay here and play with the other kids, he said to Lucy. I'll be right there at the bar if you need me. Lucy crossed her arms over the red swimsuit she was wearing. John saw her eyes fill with tears. Hey, Daddy, we'll play again when the game is over, okay? Lucy didn't answer. John kissed her on the forehead. Stay here and have fun with the other kids, he said and walked away from the playground. John sat among the other men and ordered a beer. The game had just begun. From his stool, he glanced at Lucy. She was swinging slightly, looking forlorn and abandoned. I'll play with her right after the game, he said to himself and turned back to the TV screen. Uh, Maybe during halftime. Ow! Claire's scream brought John back to the present. He stood, his heart pounding hard in his chest, and scanned the water. He had been so lost in his thoughts, he hadn't even noticed that Claire wasn't in front of him anymore. She had wandered a few yards to the left, 
probably pulled by the tide, and was at that moment limping slowly out of the water. John ran to her. What happened? He asked, seeing the expression of pain on her face at each step. I cut myself on something. She tried to put her right foot in the sand and yelped in pain again. I don't know what it is. John kneeled and looked at the sole of her foot. There was a two-inch long cut, as thin as if a razor had sliced it. It seemed very deep. Blood was pouring from it in a steady flow, and a red stain had already formed on the white sand. John stood and took Claire in his arms. Let's go back to the house, he said. I have a first aid kit in the car. Quickly, he carried her toward the cabin, leaving a trail of bloody spots behind them. John and Claire disappeared into the cabin, but the blood remained on the beach. Red. Dark. Contrasting sharply with the pure whiteness of the sand. Then, a stronger wave reached up the beach. The water spread on the sand just shy of the blood spots. Another wave followed the first. This time, the maroon turned to pink as the water carried the blood back into the ocean. Again, another wave, and another, and another. Steadily, unceasingly, the ocean licked all the blood from the sand. John walked out onto the porch and approached the chair where Claire was sitting. Softly, he massaged her shoulders. Does it ache? He asked. Her bandaged foot was resting on another chair. Not much. It just throbs a little. She sighed. <sighs> I should have listened to that fisherman in the village and stayed out of the water. That, that's ridiculous, Claire. He was just a crazy old man. What else do you come to the beach for? They were silent for a moment. A refreshing breeze was blowing from the sea and the sound of the waves crashing on the shore soothed their nerves. I love you, John, Claire said after a while, and touched the hand that was resting on her right shoulder. I love you too. More silence. They watched while the sun moved slowly down toward the horizon, painting nearby clouds a pinkish tone. It is beautiful, isn't it? Claire said, as if she could read his thoughts. Yes, it is. Very the tide's going out. John looked at the sea. He had been so captivated by the sunset that he hadn't noticed how much the water level had dropped already. Curious, he glanced at Mermaid Rock. A lot more of it was visible now. What's that thing? Claire asked. What? There, do you see it? She pointed. In the middle of the water. Something was protruding from the water, a hundred yards from the beach. Just the upper part of it was visible, tilting slightly towards the coast. At first, John didn't recognize what it was. I don't know, he said. There are two more. Look! One of them was on the left, next to Mermaid Rock. The other was near the beach on the right. Then John realized what they were. Masts, he said. Those are masts. You mean there are wrecked ships there? At least three different ships, judging from the masts. Looks like a ship graveyard to me. I bet that's why they call this Mermaid Beach. With all the shipwrecks here, the superstitious locals probably blame them on a mermaid. Claire stood quiet for a moment. John could tell, by the way she held her body and stared out at the water, that she didn't like that. She was a bit superstitious herself. He continued massaging her shoulders... Claire suddenly gasped. <gasps> Did you see that? What? Something <laughs> jumped out of the water. What? Was it a dolphin? John said, and then smiled. Or maybe it was the mermaid herself coming to tell you good night. The sun had set hours ago, and the full moon was high in the dark sky, a queen between her stars. But the tide hadn't completely gone out. With each foot it dropped, more masts became visible. There were dozens of them showing now. They protruded from the sea like a decaying forest, covered with green algae 
and red coral, pointing to the sky like accusing fingers. But the rotting masts weren't alone. On the beach, mermaid rock was now almost completely revealed. Its dark surface gleamed under the moonlight like the carcass of a newly dead animal. Claire was lying on the bed, looking at the ceiling. She could hear the wind outside howling against the cabin and the waves along the coastline. Her foot was throbbing so badly that she couldn't sleep. During the afternoon, she had felt little pain. But when she went to bed, it started getting worse, until it was so bad her whole body shivered. Slowly, as if she were underwater, she put her hand to her forehead It was hot. She was burning with fever. She turned her head and looked at John, lying beside her on the bed. He was snoring. Claire thought about waking him. She needed help. The wound had probably become infected or something. The wind blew harder against the cabin. Maybe it's just the bandage, she thought. It's probably too tight, and that's why it's throbbing. I'll go to the bathroom and change it. Claire sat up and slowly put her good foot on the ground. Her body trembled again at the feel of the cold floor. Holding onto the wall, she stood, trying not to sway. Strangely, this seemed to alleviate the pain some. Touching the wall to keep her balance, she limped toward the bathroom. John rolled over, still snoring. The sound of the waves came to her like a chant. Claire reached the bathroom. She turned on the light and sat on the toilet lid. Her body trembled again. She felt her forehead. Her temperature seemed higher than before. The wind howled. The waves crashed. She started pulling off the gauze John had covered her injured foot with. As she did, the pain diminished even further. Finally, she finished. Her foot was free again. She looked at the wound... It was swollen, and the skin around it had a purplish tone that worried her. Claire remembered the old mask they had seen that afternoon, and she wondered what she might have stepped on. A shiver ran down her spine. What if she had stepped on something poisonous? Claire decided to wake John up, to ask him to take her to a hospital. But before she could do that, something strange happened. The wind stopped whistling. The waves stopped crashing onto the shore. Silence fell over this part of the world. And in the silence, Claire heard it. A voice. A girl's voice. Distant. Singing. Hey ho, little fish. Good night. Good night. Hey ho, little fish. Good night to you. Claire stood, putting her weight on her good foot and looked through the bathroom's small window. She saw her, a little blonde girl walking on the white sand, wearing a red swimsuit. Claire trembled again. She felt the fever come back, hotter. The fever was getting worse. I'm a little fish, so white, so white. Blonde hair. Maybe she's lost, Claire thought. Red swimsuit, like the one Lucy was wearing that day. What is she doing here, alone at this hour? Claire put her injured foot on the cold floor, ignoring the sharp pain that emanated from it. Hey ho, little fish, good night, good night. Hey ho, little fish, good night to you. The wind started howling again. A stronger wave crashed on the beach. Maybe she needs help. Slowly, Claire limped toward the front door. As Claire left the bathroom, John rolled on the bed. He was dreaming. His arms thrashed. His head shook from side to side. His lips moved, emitting unintelligible sounds. Then... 
Clear words came out of his mouth. Go, he said. Go, get that ball, John shouted at the player on the television. The men around him were talking and shouting. It was an exciting game, and the beer was good. He glanced away from the screen to the playground, expecting to see Lucy. His heart stopped. Lucy wasn't there. The swing was empty, moving slowly from side to side, pushed by the wind. John stood, certain that something was wrong. He hurried to the playground. His eyes scanned the area, looking for Lucy, but she was nowhere. He ran. Lucy? He shouted. Lucy! He arrived at the swing set. A boy playing there looked frightened. Did you see a little girl in a red swimsuit? John asked the boy. She was here on the swing. Yes, she said she was going to the pool. John ran for the pool. Lucy! He shouted again. Lucy! Why didn't I stay with her? Why did I have to watch that stupid game? People were staring at him as he ranted. He stumbled into a park bench and fell. His knee was bleeding, but he didn't notice it. Lucy! He took the steps that led to the pool area two at a time. He knew what he would find before he saw it. He stopped at the edge of the pool, suddenly petrified by the horror of the scene in front of him. Lucy was in the pool, face down in the water, her blonde hair floating around her head. No! John screamed. Please, God, no! He jumped into the water, crashing in the pool as he made his way to his daughter, fighting the water to reach her. The tears that ran down his face blurred his sight. He grabbed her arm. Her skin was sickeningly cold. He turned her over and looked at the purple lips, the staring eyes, the pale face. Crying, he embraced his little girl's dead body. From the porch, Claire scanned the beach, her injured foot sending tentacles of pain through her ankle. Where did the girl go? She wondered. Her eyes ran across the sand, looking for her, seeing no one. Maybe it was a hallucination. She reasoned. Her forehead seemed hotter than ever. Maybe I need a doctor. A cold breeze blew from the ocean, throwing sand and water droplets onto her face. Unconsciously, Claire closed her eyes and hugged herself, her whole body shaking. With her eyes closed, she heard the little girl's voice again. She was still singing, and the words mixed with the sound of the wind, seeming far away. When Claire opened her eyes, she saw the child at the water's edge and wondered how she could have missed her before. The little girl was following the tide line, slowly walking toward Mermaid Rock. Her blonde hair was flying in the wind, the red swimsuit luminous in the moonlight. It was the swimsuit Lucy was wearing the day she died. Claire's head was aching now. You've been swimming all day. Dizziness overpowered her. Claire couldn't control her trembling. I'm a little fish, white, green, and blue. It can't be my baby, Claire whispered, her voice barely audible. My little girl is dead. As if she had heard Claire, the girl halted. The water surrounded her, gently caressing her small feet. Claire could feel her head burning even hotter. She could feel her foot throbbing with each pulse. She could feel the beads of sweat on her forehead, despite the cold wind. The girl turned. Claire saw her face clearly illuminated by the full moon. Suddenly, all the pain, all the worry, all the misery were gone. Claire's heart filled with joy. Lucy, she said, tears running down her cheeks. My little girl. Without thinking, Claire left the porch and stepped onto the sand, going after her long-deceased child. Ah! Crying out, John woke from his dream. 
He sat on the bed, his body covered in sweat, a scream trapped in his throat. For a moment, he didn't know where he was. But soon he recognized the cabin and was relieved. It had been such a vivid nightmare. He looked around, wondering if he had awakened his wife. But she wasn't there beside him. Claire? He called. No answer. All he could hear was the sound of the waves and the wind blowing outside. John became quickly alert when he remembered his wife's hurt foot. What if she had gone to the bathroom and fallen? She could have fainted and hit her head. He got out of bed and went to look for her. No one was in the bathroom. Something on the floor caught his eye. It was the bloody gauze. Claire had taken the bandage off. John felt uneasy. Why would she do that? Claire? He called again, louder this time. Are you all right? Still nothing. John went into the living room. When he saw the front door standing open, he knew something was wrong. He ran toward the door and looked out, his eyes widening at what he saw outside. There were even more masts protruding from the sea along Mermaid Beach. Some of them were stout and tall. Others were slender and short. Some seemed very old, eroded by time and water. Others seemed brand new, with their paint and metal parts still fresh. It was as if a forest of masts had grown up from the sea bottom during the night. No, not a forest. A graveyard. For an instant, John wondered what could have caused so many ships to wreck. But he dismissed this thought. He couldn't bother with that now. He needed to find Claire. Soon, he saw her, walking next to the water toward Mermaid Rock. The wind made her hair swirl and fly behind her. She was limping and calling to someone. John couldn't understand her over the wind, but the single word he caught was enough to freeze him in his tracks. She was calling their daughter's name. Lucy! John scanned the beach. There was nobody there besides Claire. Must be the injury, he thought. She's delirious. He had to help her. Claire! He shouted as loudly as he could. She kept walking. John left the porch, running toward her. Claire! She stopped as if she had heard, but she didn't look back at him. John tried to run faster, but his feet sunk in the sand at each step, as if the beach itself was trying to hold him. The wind blew violently against him, throwing sand in his eyes. Something insidious was happening here. He remembered the way he had run that day at the club, the day he found Lucy dead in the pool. Fear swept over him. At that same moment, Claire made a decision. Without looking back, she ran toward Mermaid Rock. Claire! John shouted again as loud as he could, but the wind muffled his voice. He tried to run even faster, only to trip and fall heavily to the ground. From where he lay, he saw Claire disappear from sight behind the rock. Hey ho, little fish, good night, good night. Lucy! Claire shouted. Wait for mommy! The little girl glanced toward Claire, giggled, and continued to walk ahead of her. Claire smiled. Lucy, her little girl... She had come back to her. Claire tried to walk faster to catch up with Lucy. She didn't notice the trail of blood from her foot that was staining the white sand. All that mattered now was that Lucy had returned. From the distance, Claire heard somebody calling her name. Claire! It was an almost inaudible voice, so muffled by the howl of the wind and the roar of the ocean. You've been swimming all day in the ocean so Lucy sang louder and smiled to her again, gesturing to her to hurry up. Now it's time to rest and just flow with the tide. Claire walked faster, the voice again, calling her name louder. Claire! This time Claire recognized it. John's voice. She stopped for a moment, unsure of what to do. Waves crashed on the beach, washing her feet and licking her blood. 
The wind threw sand on her face and swirled her hair. Let's go play, Mommy! Lucy called from ahead. Guess who me? Please don't let Daddy take me away again. Claire suddenly realized the truth of what Lucy was telling her. John had let death take her little girl from her. She wouldn't let it happen again. They would be together now, forever. Come with me, Mommy, Lucy said. Let's hide for him behind that rock. Lucy started to run toward Mermaid Rock. With the tide out, it was totally exposed now, and its wet, dark surface reflected the full moon like a distorted mirror. Come on! Lucy called her. Another wave lapped at Claire's foot. The wind blew on her back, as if it was pushing her along. She started to run. Her foot ached and throbbed with each step, but she didn't stop. Through the sound of the wind and waves, she heard John calling for her again. She didn't care. She didn't even look back. He wouldn't take her little girl from her a second time. Lucy stopped for an instant, giggling, then ran behind the dark rock. Claire followed her. With his heart racing and terror overpowering him, John ran toward the rock to find Claire was nowhere in sight. Claire! He shouted. He stepped toward the sea, scanning the water for her. No, God, please! He prayed. Not again, not again, no, please! His eyes moved from side to side over the dark roiling surface. The wind threw sea spray in his face. Then, on his left, among the masts that protruded from the water like old bones, he saw his wife. She was drowning. John ran into the water. Waves crashed against him, trying to push him under the surface. Claire! He shouted again, and water filled his mouth. He was swimming now, as hard and as fast as he could, but the waves kept pushing against him. Oh, God, not again. Please, not again. His arms ached from the effort. He stopped for a second and looked ahead, trying to see her. She was out of sight, and despair filled his soul. Then he saw her again, gasping for breath among the old masts. John swam harder still. He was close now. Please, God, please, let me save her. Don't let her die like Lucy, please. A stronger wave hit him, and he went under for a moment, choking on the seawater. His arms were burning. They felt like lead weights. He stopped and looked again. He was among the masts now. So close he could touch them if he wanted to. He could see the decaying wood, the coral, the slippery algae hanging from their tips. Claire was nowhere to be seen. Claire! Claire! He was gasping for breath. The wind blew even harder, as if it was trying to suffocate him. Claire! Nothing. A stronger wave hit him, pushing him against a mast. He hit his head, hard, and the world darkened for a moment. He sank, swallowing salt water, and came back to the surface again. His head was bleeding. He could feel the warmth on his forehead. It didn't matter. Please, God, please help me. Out of the corner of his eyes, he saw movement. A hand, Claire's hand. John swam like a man possessed. The waves pushed him. The wind suffocated him. His arms arched. His lungs burned. Nothing else mattered but saving Claire. When he reached her, she was floating face down on the water, just as Lucy had been that day at the club. John turned her over. He was expecting to see the purple lips, the pale skin, the eyes staring at nothing, the same way Lucy's eyes had stared that day. But that is not what he saw. Claire's face was gone. Where it should have been was nothing but a bloody hole. He could see teeth marks on the flesh around it, as if something had bitten her face clean off. John tried to scream, but his voice dried in his throat. Taken by panic, he tried to push himself away from the body. He grabbed the nearby masts, trying to control himself. His eyes couldn't leave the mutilated body, still floating with its head facing toward the sky. God, God, he whispered between fast breaths. We could have done this. Two green scale-covered hands sprang from under the water, 
and grabbed him by the neck. John opened his mouth to scream, but the hands brought him down under the water with superhuman force, teeth biting his side. He was already dead, his body being carried toward the wrecked ships where the mermaid fed. The sun was high in the sky when the old fisherman crossed the white sand toward the cabin. While he walked, he kept a watchful eye on the blue sea that glared in the sunlight. The tide was high now. There were no masts in sight. The water didn't seem as rough as the previous day either. The fisherman, however, kept as far from the waterline as he could. He didn't dare allow the sea to touch him until he was sure the ritual had ended for the year. Walking slowly, he passed Mermaid Rock, almost totally underwater now, and reached the cabin. He knocked at the door one, two, three times. No answer. The old fisherman opened the door and entered. He saw the disheveled bed, the sandals beside it, the clothes still in the suitcases. There was no sign of the couple, not here, nor on the beach. The fisherman sighed, relief and sadness mixing in his soul. At least there hadn't been any children this year. It was always more difficult when children were involved. He left the cabin and stopped on the porch for a minute, looking at the sea, at the sand, at the sky, So beautiful, so dreadful. He knew all the men and women would be anxiously waiting for him, eager to know if they could go back to their normal lives again. Yes, they could. The ritual was over. They would be safe now, at least until next year. The old man left the porch and started walking back toward the village. This time, however... He walked next to the water line, letting the cold sea refresh his tired feet. He wasn't afraid anymore. The sea had calmed. The mermaid had done her feeding for the year. Author's Note Hi, my name is Douglas Araújo, and I'm the author of Mermaid Witch. Thanks for listening to my history, and I hope you have enjoyed it. The first time it was published was in July 2005, by an online magazine called The Dark Crypt, and this is the first time it appears on audio. As you probably may have already realized, I am not a native English speaker. I'm Brazilian, and I currently live in São Paulo with my wife, our two children, and our dog, Aliasa Apso, called Princess. We have been living in Sao Paulo for a couple of years now, but most of my life I have lived in cities along the coast of Brazil. So the contact with the sea has been a constant in my life, and that's what inspired me to write Mermaid Beach. The ocean has always seemed to me as mysterious as beautiful, and each time I was at one of those wonderful beaches we have here in Brazil, I always kept thinking of what could be lurking just below the water surface. A mermaid, maybe? The general plot of Mermaid Beach was inspired in a short history written by Stephen King called Rainy Season. In this history, a young couple on summer vacation rent a house in a small town only to be warned repeatedly to live by the local inhabitants. They do not comply, of course, and become sacrificed during the rainy season. In general lines, this is the same that happens to John and Claire in my history. Although Mermaid Beach is not a real place, it was built with fragments from several places I knew. The Dark Rock, the White Sand, the village with the kids playing soccer, all those are fragments from real places I have been to here in Brazil. Some details in the history were also based on real facts. When I wrote the history, my daughter used to wear a head suit like the one Lucy does in the history. And my wife once injured her foot pretty much the same way Clary does. Well, thanks once again for listening to my history. Take care. Bye.
Opa, sejam bem-vindos novamente. Espero que vocês gostaram daquela história. Sei que eu gostei. E você, Richel Field, você gostou? Ah. Uh, uh... Hell no, Big Anklevich! <laughs> Thank you, thank you, what, sir. What, how did he get in here? Mildly offensive <laughs> guest star. Thank you. You saved me on that. I'm assuming you just thank people for listening, for coming back, and uh, hoped that they enjoyed the story as much as you did. I didn't know you spoke Portuguese. Oh, I speak a little of everything. Wow. Yeah, perusing the Klingon dictionary, there's some similarities. Ah, <sighs> yeah, I've heard that. Nice one, 08 OT. Mermaid Beach, good creepy stuff for uh, the month of October. Apparently written by a guy who was born on Halloween, no less. Now, you know a little bit about Brazil. I do know a little bit. Is Halloween a big deal there? No, it's not really. Is um, it considered an American import? Yeah, I, I think so. To tell you the truth, most of the holidays that we celebrate here are not celebrated there. Christmas is not a very big deal either. They don't shoot off fireworks. They do. I mean, they shoot off fireworks just because somebody scored a goal in the Fla Flu game every year, something like that. But uh, Well, do they throw water balloons at each other and lift up their shirts, anything like that? <laughs> that would be uh, the actual big holiday in Brazil, which is known as Carnaval. But the big December holiday would be New Year's Eve. That's the one that they really go all out for. Brazilians, they kind of have that image of being party animal type folks. So sitting around a Christmas tree opening presents or dressing up like a slutty nurse or whatever. Hmm. Actually, dressing like a slutty nurse would be right down their alley. Wait, wait, I'm sorry. How did, how did we get on to slutty nurses? Oh, well, Not that I'm complaining. That's Halloween, man. I don't know if you've gone down the costume aisle at your local Walmart, but if you do, there's little kid costumes and then there's slutty nurse, slutty witch, slutty schoolgirl, slutty whatever else you can think of that you can do yeah, as I a saw slutty that slutty costume. Mother Teresa. Yeah, they, the they have that. You think that's a joke, but I saw it. <laughs> now, we've got a friend of the show. Here's the thing. If I introduce Abby Hilton... As my friend, that means she's a connected guy. If I introduce her as our friend, she's a maid guy. But a friend of the show, Abby Hilton, is a nurse. Do you think we should ask her if she knows any slutty nurses? <laughs> so, you know what? Let's not talk about Mermaid Beach. Let's talk about slutty, slutty Halloween instead. costumes. Okay. Yeah. Or, or just slutty nurses. You know, the, the nurse outfit has gone from being something that you can fantasize over to just being blah. Real nurses wear really baggy, sloppy looking scrubs, a mask. And usually the scrubs are like some kind of outlandishly awful pattern on it i don't know if you've seen a lot of those <laughs> or their little hat that they wear their little keep the hair in hat they're not really it's called a yarmulke actually they're not really hair nets are they they're something else i don't know yeah that whole nurse thing has just gone from being something sexy to being something not i guess there's always nostalgia to bring back the old little white outfit thank you for joining us on offend everyone week here at the doomsday that's right next up the irish <laughs> This conversation has derailed. You're right, announcer man. I was talking about something before we got onto the slutty nurse thing. We were uh, talking a little bit about, about Brazil. Brazilians, yeah. You know, they don't go trick-or-treating or do Halloween like uh, those of us in the U.S. do. I wonder about our folks across the pond. Does Michael Stone and his uh, mates, do they do trick-or-treating in the... I think Halloween is a fairly big deal everywhere that American culture has permeated. Uh huh. But nowhere is it as big a deal as it is here. Right. And I have no complaints about how big a deal Halloween is. <laughs> you know, you'll hear people complain. They've forgotten the true meaning of Halloween. It's so commercialized. <laughs> and, you know, people say that of all the holidays, it's the second biggest yeah, spending. Second biggest moneymaker. And uh, I couldn't be any more pleased about that. And uh, yeah, it is October, although. You know, by the time we get this episode done, it may be in time for the big New Year's party in Brazil. <laughs> yeah. There are so many things we could talk about on Mermaid Beach. Uh, this is one of those interesting stories where you read it first. Did I? Yeah, you did. That's really rare nowadays. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's rare for either of us to That's be the first true. reader now. That's true. It was one of those where, uh, and I, I can't remember exactly what you said in your email back to me, but it was something like, oh, this story couldn't have been more down my alley. It's exactly the kind of thing that I just love. Well, we talked last week about the unfounded fears, and right here we got ghosts, we got children, 
uh, malevolent children or whatever. <laughs> that's that's two down there, you know. And and the creatures of the sea. I don't, I don't Technically, think... she wasn't a ghost, but for all legal purposes, I think we can say it's a ghost. Uh, pulling up your email here. Oh, you still have it? Yeah, it says uh, this is the second time this happened for me. About page three, I knew I'd be accepting this story. I don't know what it was, really, just a feeling, a sense of being taken along a journey, of being swept off by a master storyteller, the way a good song can grab you and transport you to another place. Are you mocking me? Wow, I've never done anything like that before. Why would I start now? Okay, it just sounded like... It's funny, too, because further down in your email here, you say, this story reminded me of the sort of thing you would write. <laughs> If that's not a compliment, then it reminded me a bit of a Stephen King story called Rainy Season, a story I quite admire. Huh. Obviously, uh, you both read that story because he said he was uh, inspired even by that same story that it reminded you of. Uh, now, Douglas talked about... Is it okay to call him Douglas? You can, you how you how do you say, say Douglas. it? I would say Douglas, but you can say Douglas. He'll. It's not a Portuguese name, though. Yeah, Brazilians are always stealing American names. That's pretty standard. They do. It's probably not an American name either. Um, but yeah, the the structure of this and Rainy Season are exactly the same. And Rainy Season is one of those stories that I like, but at the same time I don't like because it's so bleak. And you know, if if there that's are that's why it reminded you of my stories, huh? A lot of your stuff can be real <laughs> unpleasant. Yeah, I don't mean that as a criticism. It's just your horror stories are often unsettling and you know that's what a good horror story should do but yeah if somebody said hey i didn't like this story at all because it was so inevitable or it was so what's the word you know from almost the very beginning that things are going to end badly and, but you know what there there's a long tradition not just stephen king for that sort of thing of just the people who don't heed the warning the people who don't know any better but we know better right it sucks to be the person watching and knowing, oh, geez, it's only a matter of time. I hate it when children die. Then you shouldn't read your own fiction. Oh, that wasn't me. I was just quoting the story. But mm. I, Dude, I've seen so many horror movies, it would sicken you to know. And a lot of times people will pull their punches. People will take the safe way out because they don't want to upset anybody. It's okay that all of New York City sinks into the sea. Just as long as we see the dog swim away. It's like, oh, we couldn't have, you know, something happen to the pregnant woman or the child or whatever. And that's a kind of safety playing that's not really necessary in horror because the whole point is to make people uncomfortable, to make them scared, to make them worry. I think we've talked about this before. When you have the unhappy ending in almost any genre, it can turn people off to the story. No matter how good the story may have been, people will just be like, when... The girl didn't come back at the end, and he was left alone after all that. Sure was a downer. Downers is not okay, but in horror, it's almost required. You know, if I had done my homework, we could have done like a top five unhappy endings. <laughs> I don't know if it would be number one on my list, but it would definitely be up there. It would be the ending to the remake of Invasion of the Body Snatchers, the 1978 one. The ending of that movie, all these years later, it's still one of the awfulest things I've ever seen. <laughs> oh, boy, I just remember being a little boy and having seen that on television and then having to go and brush my teeth. And I was afraid to look at myself in the mirror. It was <laughs> I was just so upset by that ending. And yet, so often people are just afraid. They don't want to upset somebody. You know, and maybe it's not 100% cowardice. If you're a good storyteller, if you're a good writer, you create characters that people like, that they care about. And you don't want to see somebody you care about suffer or die. You want to see them make it through and triumph. Right. That's and probably why my stories always end with a main character dying. And just because I don't create characters that people like, they're like, wow, that guy sucks. I hope he dies at the end and his kid. <laughs> well, okay. I'm thinking of one story you wrote and the very first broken mirror story <laughs> that we ever did had the same premise of some malevolent force threatening the infant of the main character. And in my story, I mean, I, I don't have any kids. And yet when it came time to choose whether the little baby would live or die, I was just like, well, of course it's going to live. I'm not some kind of sick, effed up bastard. 
<laughs> and you, who have children, are a and were inspired bastard. by your own fears, killed that kid at the end. And it was just like, oh, I can't believe he went there. So that ending is memorable. And that father character was not unlikable in any way. And of course, the baby was just an innocent Mm -hmm. A lot of times in our entertainment, we want to see people suffer, but then come out yeah, come through. okay. Well, that's kind of the general idea of storytelling. You know, you give somebody a problem and then they have to figure their way through it. But with horror, that's not necessarily this guy's going to make his way out. Although it does happen. It happens plenty that they wind up defeating the zombies or defeating the vampires or defeating whatever. They lose an awful lot in doing it, but they still manage to make their way out, at least some of them. Maybe most of the group is gone, and Jason has hacked up the uh, camp counselors, but one or two of them has made it out in the end. As far as those, like Jason and Freddy and Mike Myers movies, uh, specifically the Austin Power slashers, they knew they were going to make other sequels, and the people are going to see these movies for the bad guy anyway. Why did they never dare let Jason or Michael or Freddy Finish just win? I don't understand. You know you're doing sequels, so you can't kill Freddy anyway. Why not just have ha 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 the end? I suppose that's how Nightmare 2 ended. And if you're listening and you're a horror fan, you don't like Nightmare on Elm Street 2. But it's the only one of those sequels that is any damn good. I don't know. I guess because you relate to the teenager rather than to the killer. It's hard to see your uh, your hero get all the way to the end and then not make it through. You give me such a hard time all the time about how I kill off all my characters at the end and every story ends with this terrible death of whoever. I don't know that I'm making fun of you. It's just you've gone there once and then you go there again and again and I just start to sense a pattern. Maybe in the future we will just talk about unhappy endings and things that have stuck with us. And, oh, do you remember that when this happened? Or do you remember that story where kind of thing? And that would be fun. Uh huh. I think for the most part people like happy endings. It's probably because in real life there aren't a heck of a lot of them. <laughs> when you see somebody that you care about make it through and win the prize and nail the cheerleader, you feel good. You share in his triumph. Mm -hmm. And so that's always going to be the majority of endings is the happy one. Would I have liked this story as much or been so excited about it if they had made it out okay? I don't think so. Yeah, I would say probably not. It wouldn't have seemed true to what was going on. Now, you and I are way too close to this story to say whether it's scary or not or say whether it's effective or not, I think. Because mm -hmm. we worked a lot on this story. Right. But that scene where he rolls his wife over in the water and her face is gone, I hope that we delivered that shock the way that it was delivered to me when I first read Douglas's story, where you're just like, oh, I didn't expect that. Didn't expect I didn't have no face. <laughs> that kind of thing. And he, he already said that he has published this somewhere else. But hopefully the advantage of audio is that we made it creepier. And specifically, I'm thinking of the little girl. Now, we got your kid in here to do it again, right. and I don't know how long we spent. An hour? <laughs> two hours? How long did we... It was we... a long time we spent on that. It was mostly the song. I mean, her lines she did fine with, but Rish actually invented a tune for the song that's in this story, and we were trying to teach my little seven-year-old how to sing this song. <laughs> Do you have some audio that you can play of us teaching her the song with you singing and her singing? You know? Sure, yeah. Can, you, can you play that right now? Hey, Oedo, do you want to play that little... <laughs> Thanks, man. Hey, ho, little fish, good night, good night. Hey, ho, little fish, good night to you. Hey, hey ho, little, little fish, fish, good night, good night. Hey, ho, little fish, good night to you. Hey, ho, little fish, good night, good night. Hey, ho, little fish, good night to you. It's kind of hard. Yeah, it, it is a song that doesn't exist. Uh huh. And trying to teach her a song that she's never heard before and will never hear again was actually kind of hard. The funny thing, though, was once we'd sung it as many times as we did, it, it was running through our head the rest of the night. Well, besides me. I hope that Douglas thinks that we did a good job. Maybe. A bang up job, even if I may be so bold. If I may be so bold. How would you translate bang up job into Portuguese? I'm sure I don't know. I heard that. Fair enough. <laughs> uh, you, uh, being a dad, mm -hmm. and having a little girl like you do, mm -hmm. 
and having her uh, drown when you were watching, uh, was it the Rose Bowl? It, no, it was one of those awful bowls that doesn't even count in the regular season. No, it was actually the Expedia.com bowl, I think it was, oh, or, or one shame. of those. Yeah. Did that make the story more relevant to you, more scary, more relatable? Considering that the fact that my daughter died was all just BS that we were just throwing out, um, not really. <laughs> You know, I think someone out there would probably know I was lying. I, I... As a father, I always feared something like that happening to my kid. I'm more scared of being the parent who has the child who has drowned than I am of being the guy who's trying to save his wife and there's a mermaid that wants to eat me under the water, to tell you the truth. Well, that's because you don't live anywhere near the coast. Now, that if you be, were yeah. back in, are you at all afraid of the ocean? Is this something we've ever talked about before? You know, I kind of am. You know, we talked about the irrational fears, and that's something that I never thought about, to tell you the truth. But one time we were just jet skiing out in the ocean. <laughs> this kind of, I guess, has to have some context to it because it, it's a silly thing. But at the time that I was doing this jet skiing, I had also just auditioned for some stupid, crappy, independent horror film that somebody was making in town about people who accidentally create a gigantic snake in the river is swimming around this water serpent and he keeps eating rafters or something like that a short while later we're out at the lake jet skiing i suck at jet skiing this is like my first time ever doing this and so as soon as i get going and get up i fall down and uh i look across the water and i think it was probably just a wake of some other water craft that had gone by but i swear it looked like some kind of a large water snake and I'm just like, ah, freaking out, knowing that that's absolutely ridiculous, the stupidest thing to be afraid of, because there's no giant water serpent. But that's one of those things that I kind of live in fear of, is being in the water and then feeling something brush against my leg under the water. Well, we're not top of the food chain when we're in the water. We're not masters of that particular domain. Maybe it isn't a universal fear, but I'm certainly guilty of seeing the darkness of the water and imagining something is there and being terrified to get in the water because of that. We're just not designed for, uh, you know, movement in that kind of space. And we have flippers or whatever we may put on. But even then, any old shark or any old creature that wants to come along and make a meal of us, we don't stand much of a chance. That's probably why Jaws is such a scary film. And we realize that one big bite with all those teeth and it's all over. So thank you for reminding us of our mortality, Douglas. And thank you for listening if you've sat here suffering through it because you've had a stroke and you can't turn off the player. Hey, Big, before the traditional part where we cause people to turn the episode off early, I, I was wondering if you'd do me a favor. Probably not. Uh, you know me. Yeah, but, but I was really wanting to know how our podcast got its name. You always said that one day you'd tell me. Rish? Yes, Big? That day is now. Cool. I was a teenager... Not yet a man. I was having troubles at home, feeling lost and hopeless, wondering who I was. My parents were always fighting, and I decided to run away. So I packed my stuff, gathered all my cash together, knocked up my girlfriend, made myself a bunch of peanut butter sandwiches, and headed into the city to make my dreams come true. Which city, man? I'd rather not say, you know? Well, I, I guess. So I got to Oakland. And in town, I found this shelter slash hostel slash halfway house place that was just for teenagers with behavior problems, drug addictions, mental disorders, uh, those baggy pants that hang down below their butt lines, emotional issues, all that stuff. Mm. I signed the form. I got a drink of water and received my own little room with a box spring and a blanket, an electrical outlet and a bedpan, and went to sleep for the night. Dude, were there girls there too? Oh, you have no idea. Really? Really? No idea, no. So I was sleeping, and in the middle of the night, there's this bright light shining in my face. I figured it was that really twitchy security guard again, the one with the really hairy neck, but... When I opened my eyes, 
I found the last person I could have ever guessed to find in the room. Obi-Wan Kenobi. No way! Indeed way. It was Obi-Wan in his brown cloak and hood. He looked at me and he said, We have a message for you, my boy. I looked around and found that Obi-Wan was not alone. In the room were the Angel Gabriel, Morpheus from The Matrix, Coach Dale from Hoosiers, Dobby from Harry Potter, Zeus, Rachel Ray, and the members of Guar. Wow, Guar? Yes, except for Beefcake the Mighty for some reason. They told me that I had a great destiny if I would only grab it. And that I should forget my aspirations of becoming a truck driver. Because fate had much bigger role for me. They told me to study hard in school. Kill my parents. Get a degree in broadcasting. Marry a Canadian. And create... Hey, uh, Big. What? Do, Do what to your parents? Dude, you're missing the most important part. They told me to create a podcast called the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine, and to put my heart and soul into it, putting out episodes as often as thrice a month, and that if I worked hard and begged for donations often enough, I would change the world. Wow. This is a true story? As true as any I've ever told you. So, so, so what did you do? Well... I went back to sleep, of course, Uh, but the next afternoon, I awoke and packed up what few possessions hadn't been stolen from me during the night and went out to fulfill my proud calling. I checked out of the shelter, which was about to be shut down by the EPA anyway, and enrolled in community college the same day. Wait, wait, why, why was it being shut down? Oh, some juvenile delinquent put LSD in the water supply. It messed up a bunch of kids. One even died. Really? Might have been three. But anyway, that was the day that changed my life. I can fairly say that I wouldn't be here right now if it weren't for that experience. No, I'd probably be in my room sleeping. It's pretty late. Big weeks ago when we did that rip-off story about the fairy king and we were talking about people being told they were meant for greater things why, why why didn't you tell this story then actually i don't remember anything about my life back then it's just a blur or a smudge whichever's darker so you remember nothing no details no and where was this place you stayed the hunter s thompson shelter for wayward youth inner city east division Established 1971 on Munch Avenue in Oakland, California. Two and a half stories of jello green brick. And how long ago did it happen? Dude, I told you I don't remember any details. Nothing. Well, I had to ask. Apparently you did. Okay, uh, hey, we have a, a promo to play. Really? Yeah. Uh, so, 08 OT, can you, can you roll that for us? Be a good one. Be a good one. Shh. Listen, can you hear them? Voices, a multitude of voices, some whispering, some shouting, and some even screaming. Listen to them. They all have something to say. <laughs> But don't listen so closely. You might not like what you hear. <laughs> Broken Sea Audio Productions presents the third annual Halloween audio season. Voices in the Dead of Night. Coming October 2009 to BrokenSea.com. All right, so there you have it. Uh, check it out. Uh, I think it's something you guys will like. Yeah, I'm, I'm fairly sure you can get away with saying that, yeah. Okay, so that was our show. But before we go, just want to remind people that it's October. 
We've got a contest going, the October Scary Story Event. <laughs> if you'd like to send us a story, send it to submissions at doonsteef.com. If it's a scary story that you started writing this October, you have until November 1st to send it to us and just put October Scary Story Event uh, you could probably even time. send it as late as November 5th, but you should finish writing it October 31st. But yeah, just send it our way and we'll put it in the pile and shake it around and reach in and grab one out just randomly. Wait, no, I think we're actually going to read them, huh? No, not me, but you, yes. <laughs> we'll pick the best stories and we'll put them on the show. So uh, yeah, please, let's all join hands and write scary stories together. That works. You know what? If you aren't up to writing a scary story in October, you can still help out the show. We pay our authors. We pay the people who win our silly little events. Or we, we pay Douglas. Really? Yeah, we pay everyone who allows us to pay them. Some people say, no way, I ain't taking your stinking filthy money. But that doesn't happen really all that often. Why well, I hadn't washed my hands in such a long time. It was just the, well, okay, it was more than once, but only one guy complained. Right. So, uh, yeah, we do pay authors. We don't pay them a lot, but we do pay them, and, and we definitely need help on that front. So if you're feeling in the giving mood, there's a little button that you can just press right there on the uh, right side of the website. You can give $5 a month. You can give a one-time donation. It's all up to you. You just pick your poison. Please press the button. That's right, announcer man. Any more business we need to take care of? I don't think so. All right, so I guess that's our show for today. I think it is. Thanks for listening, and uh, yeah, signing off. I'm Big Anglovich. And I'm Rish Outfield. Darling, it's better down where it's wetter. Take it from me. Good night. See ya. Thank you for listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Today's episode is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. You may share these files with anyone, but you may not charge for them or alter them. Take two. But it's just... Oh, better. yeah. It's better, right? You're close. Uh, you see that rock up there? Yeah, that's uh, Mermaid Beach. That rock is mermaid rock. Um, thank you, sir. What, hey, what is a, uh, a, 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 a Yankee doing uh, down here in South America, if you don't mind me asking? <laughs> That's a good question. Turns out my ship wrecked here on this beach 40 years ago. You, you realize that the, what, the capital what? is just about three miles up this road. <laughs> There's an airport. That's how we got here. <laughs>